So, yeah, Genesis chapter 11, uh, Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1, and the title of my message today is uh, United Nations Agenda 2030, The Quest for World Government, The Quest for World Government. A little bit more political tone to it. So the United Nations Agenda 2030, the quest for world government. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Are we there? Yes, for a moment there, Jen. I'm going to read the first nine verses, and I'm going to make a parallel here with what's happening today. So here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 11. And this was in the days of, uh, just after the flood, the days, uh, the days of the Tower of Babel, Nimrod where we get really all the pagan religions, you know, uh, the Babylonian mystery religions. This is where Roman Catholicism is born out of and everything else. Even Hinduism, all of these religions are born right out of this account right here. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You notice the one, one, one. And it came to pass as he journeyed from the east that they found a place in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. By the way, cities here always have a negative connotation. If you notice, the greatest sins, the greatest wickedness always happen in cities, metropolitan areas. It hasn't changed through this time, since this time. So let us build us a city and a tower. And you've got high rises right here, the first high rise whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us uh, make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Keep that in mind. The people is one. And they have all one language, and this to begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. This is the Trinity here. Let us... God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So at this time, the Lord was, there was one language that they spoke. And we're not only, not only, we're not only speaking of written and spoken language here, but it's also of mentality, right? They thought the same way. They were of one accord. So let's, get, uh, so let's go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And just before I kind of continue there, there is actually technology now, and I've mentioned this before, where... Say Jen can only, there, actually I watched a, a video where they were showing you with the use of AI. There was one gentleman that was in, from America, another, another woman from Sweden, and she would speak in Swedish, and this computer, or this AI, computer AI, would then take what she said and then repeat in English, perfectly repeat it in English. And then he would speak to her in English, and it would repeat to her in, in Swedish exactly what he said, perfectly. So that they can communicate with each other, right? So in a sense, it's almost like even if you speak multiple different languages, you can have one language now. You can have one language. Let's move forward over to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to read verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. I'll give you some time to get there, Mrs. Jaffe. Give you a little bit of time. No rush. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And while, while you're at it, keep your math, your uh, finger in Matthew 24 as well. So that's where we're going to be going as well. Because there's a parallel passage to this. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. I'll give you a moment. You're there, you're there. Okay, we're going to start with Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that, and at that time, 
shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, the speaking of Israel here, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. So we know that this is yet to be fulfilled, and it's coming. We know what time that is. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Every one of them shall be found written in the book. That's the time of Israel's salvation. Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, and Jesus weighs in on this here. This is the parallel passage. Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. And of course, this is, speaks of the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation. Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. And the Bible says this. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. <clears throat> and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Those days shall be short. I mean, you really think about now, you've got Putin there uh, threatening with uh, the use of nuclear weapons. You've got King Jong-un there in North Korea threatening the same. And we've got enough nuclear arsenal that can blow this world to smithereens, right? That no flesh would be saved. Of course, God will intervene there. God will intervene. And except for, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And there'll be seven years. So I'd like to point out that all of us here are blessed to be living what I believe to, the, to be the final generation before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to this earth, where he will then rule and reign for 1,000 years in Jerusalem. We're literally in the 11th hour of that time. Now, prophetically speaking, when we look at what is happening in the world, we can clearly see that things are now moving at an almost breakneck speed. The time is indeed at hand. For those of us who are students of the Bible, and I hope that all of you are here, we know that prior to the return of our Lord, God will allow Satan to form a one world government that will last a total of seven years. This is prophetically known as Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 9 verse, uh, Daniel 9, verse 27, and also the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. This brief, brief period of time will, will occur shortly after the rapture of the saints of God, the family of God. The Lord's church will not be here on earth during the time, during that time, contrary to what, or rather contrary to the, what those who hold to other rapture positions have on the that hold to other rapture, uh, rapture positions who believe the church or the Christians will go through all or part of the seven year tribulation. No, this time period is exclusively addressed to Israel. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9 makes this abundantly clear. Shortly after the seven years, of, seven years of Judah's captivity, Daniel prays to the Lord on behalf of his people Israel, not the church, but Israel. He prays on behalf of his people Israel. The whole future church age would not have been known to Daniel because it was a mystery that was only revealed in the New Testament. In verse 20 of Daniel chapter 9, Near the end of Daniel's prayer, he wrote this. He says, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel. Right? Israel. So whose sin was he confessing here? Whose sin? Well, that's right. It was the sin of his, of his sins, firstly, and the sin of his people, Israel. There is no church here. There's no church age here. He wouldn't have known about it because God never revealed this to him. In fact, while he was praying, we later learn that the angel Gabriel appeared in the vision and gave Daniel the prophecy of the 70 weeks. The first for the set which, uh, of which the first seven weeks, that is 49 years, were fulfilled in 445 BC during the reign of Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes the king of Persia, when he gave the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem and we, we rebuild Jerusalem in 445 BC, rather, I'm getting tongue twisted here, but to rebuild Jerusalem, the walls and the streets thereof. The next 62 weeks were fulfilled when the Messiah came as the prince in Daniel 9 and verse 25. This occurred when Christ entered Jerusalem riding on an ass a few days before his crucifixion and was acclaimed as the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Since then, there has been an approximately 2,000 year gap between the 69th week and the 70th week, which is yet to be fulfilled. So there's been that 2,000 that 2, year gap. And obviously, Daniel would not have known about this. 
This time period is effectively known, or this gap is effectively known as the church age, where God is primarily, primarily working through his churches. This does not mean that Israel has been forsaken. They haven't. God, God has never forsaken Israel. I don't believe, and we ought not to believe, that Israel has now been replaced by the quote-unquote church. They have not. They have not. God has a separate plan for Israel, and right now he has a plan for his churches, and he's working through these churches through his churches to fulfill the Great Commission. So this does not mean that Israel has been forsaken. They have not. But what it does mean is that God is working right now through his churches in fulfilling the Great Commission, right? To go out and preach the gospel, teach men all things, baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right? And then disciple them, right? So it's it's a threefold aspect of it. And the church wants to become a member of the body here. So concerning the 70 week prophecy of Daniel, David Cloud says the 70 says this the 70 weeks will finish the transgression and make an end of sins. This refers to the completion of Israel's transgression of God. Israel's rebellion was the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in 586 BC and by Rome in 70 AD. And she has never repented nationally. She has never. She has never. This will happen at the end of the 70 weeks. It is during this time that Israel will corporately be redeemed when she looks upon him whom she had pierced 2,000 years ago, gloriously coming in the clouds at the second coming. This will be at the end of the seven year tribulation. Once again, the seven-year tribulation is not for the churches. I want to reiterate this. We are not appointed under God's wrath. This will exclusively be a time when God judges Israel and also the world for rejecting the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind. This world that we are living in right now has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And because you have rejected Him, they have therefore received that spirit of Antichrist. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that this world is looking for a savior. And that savior, sadly, is not for, is not the Lord Jesus, not for them, rather, the Lord Jesus Christ. That savior for them is not the Lord. So Satan is going to step in, and God will allow him. And he will step in with his man, who I believe right now is waiting in the wings to rule this world. And God will allow him a short period of time to do so. It will be the at the midpoint of the great tribulation or the tribulation period known as the great tribulation in where he will reign for three and a half years so in the seven year tribulation you've basically got the one world government formed you've got the covenant uh confirmed by the antichrist and during that three and a half year the first three and a half years he's going to build up his popularity and it's going to get to the point where he will destroy that one world religion that will form and he will be the object of worship he will be the object of worship and of course, he'll be defeated when the Lord Jesus, when we come back with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are looking forward to that. So Satan has his man waiting in, in, the, in the wings uh, to rule the world, and God will allow it for a short time as a means, really, of sending them a strong delusion, if you will. Really, that's really part of it. I know we often think one event, but really, the strong delusion can be a culmination, really, of deception, right? And not God's deception. God's going to allow Satan to deceive. God says, okay, you don't want me? There you go. Take the alternative. Take the alternative. It is during the seven year tribulation that the whole world will worship the Antichrist. They will worship the pseudo Messiah, the man of sin, the son of perdition. They will they will worship him and will be and will willingly rather receive his mark for the purposes of operating in his economy. In doing so, they will be eternally damned. This is the impartable sin, or rather the impartable sin of the seven-year tribulation is that of choosing to receive Satan's mark of the beast. Now, of course, that's not for us. We will not be confronted with that choice. We'll be gone. But there will be those who will, and there will be those who will get saved during that time that will pay with their heads. Pay with their heads. You know, I just recently found out that even in America, there are laws, even under Obama, Obama just, there are laws, that they're hidden because there's so many laws being passed you can't keep track that calls for the beheading of people really? calls for the beheading I forgot there's a there's a document that, uh, there's a, uh, it's under the Obamacare document mm -hmm. and there is something in there if you look there's a point in there and you've got to look at it where it calls for the beheading for the necessary beheading decapitation 
I'd have to pull that up. I'd like to find it, but it calls for that. So he, I mean, Obama is a type of antichrist, just as Joe Biden is. In fact, many say that Obama, this is right now Obama's third term. It's really not, you know, not, uh, not Joe Biden. So let's turn uh, to Revelation 13. Turn to Revelation 13. <clears throat> Revelation 13. I'm going to read the first, uh, the first uh, nine verses, and then we're going to move over to verse 16 right after that. The Bible says, And they stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads revert to previous Gentile kingdoms, and the ten horns, the ten kings, that will rule over a ten nation or a ten region confederate. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, speaking of Satan here, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. This speaks of political power. This speaks of, as authority of that of a king. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. In other words, they worshipped Satan, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, the Antichrist here, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And it was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. What is forty and two months, gentlemen? Forty and two months? Three, three and a half years, absolutely. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against, to, against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of uh, life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This tells you that everyone who's lost, who's never received Jesus Christ during that period of time, they are going to willingly and lovingly, or whatever you want to call it, worship Satan in flesh. They're going to worship him. And remember, Satan doesn't come with two pitchforks. He's, he's going to come as Jesus Christ, as a counterfeit Jesus Christ. He's going to convince the world that he's the, the world that he's the Messiah, that he's the Savior, he's the Redeemer, and they were going to and they're going to receive him openly and gladly. And of course, evidence of that is by receiving his mark, because it's contingent upon uh, worship. It's contingent contingent upon worship, and it will operate in his economy. And I think Satan's going to uh, throw in a few uh, bones there, because what I've been reading on all the technologies that are coming out. I think God will allow it. For instance, I know that Bill Gates, prior to the COVID pan the C pandemic, I've got to be careful now, they're going to cut yeah. me off here. The C pandemic, he had invested half of his net worth in life extension uh, uh, technology, which I believe is out. I, I, I've seen it in the, in the documentary where they have uh, nanobots that can repair cells. They've got the nanotechnology that can destroy you and kill you. They have this that can repair cells. And so on and so forth. I don't believe, do I believe this will work? Absolutely not, because the Bible doesn't bear this out. It does not bear it out. But this will be the deception, right? It's a counterfeit eternal life, right? I mean, I openly saw in this documentary that they're saying that you can extend human life up to 500 to 1,000 years, right? And uh, to me, that's, that speaks openly of, of Satan's counterfeit eternal life. You know, Satan wants to be like the Most High, and he's going to counterfeit everything that God is. I mean, it'll be exponential or infinitely well not exponential but infinitely inferior but he's going to seek to counterfeit it so verse 9 here if any man have an ear let him hear right again he's not speaking to the churches not speaking to the churches you hear in revelation 2 and verse 3 i mean revelation chapters 2 and 3 he is right he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the church but here's if any man have an ear let him hear and verse 16 now and he, speaking of the false prophet here, his right-hand man, his religious leader, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Okay, this is all strata of society. That includes the Bill Gates of the world and so on and so forth, and others of his ilk. Free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
And let's move forward now to Revelation chapter 14. Because this is the fate that of those that receive the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And I want to tell you right now, John MacArthur believes that those that receive the mark of the beast can still get saved and be redeemed. There is video evidence of him preaching this. He says this. And this is in contradiction to this scripture here in Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to start in verse 9 here. And the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. They're going to be tormented. It says in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. They're going to, they're going to see God there. Yet they, they'll never be able to see, they'll never be able to relate to him or whatever, right? Relate to him and, and be redeemed by him and whatnot. How tormenting is that? Verse 11, and the smoke, rather, of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Right? They have no rest. There's no redemption for those that choose to receive it. This is a warning to the world. Get saved now. Get saved now. Know Jesus Christ is your Savior. The time is at hand. Well, many of us, I trust all of us here are saved. But if you're not, know Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through this period. You don't have to go through through the prospects of choosing, literally, the line they're choosing Jesus or Satan. So it is clear that the seven-year tribulation will be a time of God's judgment and outpouring of His wrath. And it will be a time characterized by rampant deception. Jesus did say that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. He did. In fact, at the beginning of his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, he warned his disciples to take heed that no man deceive them. Take heed that no man deceive them. Who's saying take heed that no man deceives? I believe that even applies right now. Take heed. We're living in dark days of deception. Now, of course, this was, uh, this was in the context of false Christs and false teachers. But we can extend this even further to mean rampant deception as a whole. Right now, we're currently living in days of great deception. And it'll only get worse after the rapture. Christians right now are acting as the restrainer of all-out evil. Through, really, all-out evil through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We're really... Well, first of all, we're keeping... Uh, we're the ones who are keeping the Antichrist from being revealed. That wicked one to be revealed. Once we're gone, he will be revealed to the world. Furthermore, the seven-year tribulation will culminate with the formation of a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world economic system. Now, remember our opening text from Genesis 11, where the Lord says, the people is one? Well, the people will be one again under the headship of the Antichrist, Satan's man. We will see a repeat of history once again, which basically, the repeat of history is a biblical principle. And Solomon bears this out in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And he says this, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath already been of old time, which was before us. So friends, history will repeat itself, and it has over and over again. So now that we've established the conditions for the end times, I would like, us, I would like to bring to your attention a plan that is known as the United Nations Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. The United Nations Agenda 2030 is essentially a plan to reset the world as we know it and replace it with a system of complete global governance. Here, the individual nation state will give way to a centralized global authority, namely the United, the United Nations. Rather, Back in September of 2021, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, Gutierrez called for United Nations with more teeth. In other words, he wants to uh, he wants to be he wants the United Nations to have more authority, more power than it does already. More power and authority, and this is not good considering the United Nations is essentially run by totalitarians. You don't want a UN with more teeth. You certainly don't. However, God may be thinking otherwise to bring about His perfect prophetic plan. 
You know, there is a reason why God has ordained the individual sovereign nation states rather than the, the rather than one world rather than the one world global state that we see being fulfilled in Revelation. In the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13 and, verse, and also 17 and 18, as well as going back to Genesis chapter 11. There is a reason why God has ordained the individual nation state, and many of them. Many of them. And that is, if one of the nations go rogue, others can rise up to keep that nation in check. It is a mechanism of accountability. With a one world government, the checks and balances are completely gone and tyranny can then run rampant. And this is what we will see happen. In fact, we are seeing this happen as we're becoming a more globalized community. And this is where we're heading. So what is the UN Agenda 2030? What is it? And how does it factor in, prophetically speaking, with regards to the end times? Well, from a prophetic standpoint, it does factor in greatly and it does factor in profoundly. Absolutely. For starters, the United Nations Agenda 2030 was basically spawned from the UN Agenda 21 that was signed on, that was signed on to from its member or 193 member states back in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. So it's been around for a long time. So basically, this is a successor. The Agenda 21, or rather, Agenda 21, is the worldwide plan for sustainable development that is implemented at the local level through various city councils and also our provinces. And it's across the globe. That's the subtlety of it. So it's a plan that's really operated at the, the local level, your townships and all that. Whereas the Agenda 2030 is a worldwide plan for sustainable development that is implemented at the national and worldwide levels. Our, our nation is completely committed to this. We have a hundred, if you go on the government's website, there's a hundred page document, which I've not read. I've read bits and pieces, but the whole document, I don't really have the time and nor am I really that interested to read the whole document on Canada's commitment to filling the 17 goals of Agenda 2030. So where I work at Costco, they release a monthly sustainability newsletter based on fulfilling these goals. Corporations are, are to adhere, major, especially multinational corporations like Costco and others, Walmart, and they, they, they are signed on to adhering to these uh, the principles or the goals that are laid out in the 17 uh, sustainable goals of Agenda 2030. So Costco being a multinational uh, global entity, no doubt, no doubt rather, must conform to the 17 sustainable goals under the United Nations Agenda 20 in order, to, in order rather to effectively compete in the global market. So this is the reason to compete in the global market. And this is where we are going. And with Costco, you can see it and others. I'm not just, I'm just mentioned Costco as an illustration because I've worked there. You, you can see, you know, uh, the, the principles of inclusivity, equity, and all that. Uh, recently, as I mentioned, that we've changed all of our uh, metal, like high wattage metal halide lights in our warehouse to LED lights. Again, this is conforming to this agenda. And I'm sure there's some kind of credits that they receive and whatnot. I'm, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I'm, I'm, I suspect. I suspect. So when did the United Nations 2030 come to be? Well, on September the 25th, 2015, of 2015, the 193 member United uh, member United Nations General Assembly for formally adopted rather the uh, 2030 agenda for tw for sustainable development along with asset along with uh, sorry, the asset of the uh, with asset of both I think I may have a typo here, but along with the bold new global goals, which then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon hailed as a universal, integrated, and transformative vision for a better world. Again, a universal, integrated, and transformative vision for a better world. They actually think they're going to make this world a better place with this plan. I believe they actually are deceiving the thinking that. So in other words, the United Nations, which represents the nations and the people of the world, came together and agreed upon what they have termed Agenda 2030. And this is a set of goals for the entire planet that will be universally binding on everyone, everywhere. In short, the United Nations intends to impose new laws, rules, regulations, programs, and initiatives upon every human being in the world in an effort to accomplish a series of 17 goals that they feel are in the best interests of the planet, which they lump under the term sustainability. Look for it. Look at billboards, McDonald's, sustainable, sustainable, sustainable meat, sustainable burgers, whatever, sustainable nuggets. You see it all over the place. If you keep that in mind, 
it will stand out. So then, what is so bad about sustainability? It sounds good, doesn't it? On the surface, it does sound positive and, no, and a noble thing. After all, being good stewards of the environment is a noble cause. In fact, as Christians, we ought to be good stewards of this earth, this God-created earth. But it's really to give glory to Him. Let's give glory to Him. Who doesn't want to help the poor? Who doesn't want to end poverty? Who doesn't want to end war, conflict, and suffering? Who doesn't want cures to be found that would er eradicate diseases? We all do, of course. Of course. Who in their right mind would oppose all of this? After all, since these are all noble causes, who would want who wouldn't want all of these? Who wouldn't want all of these really to come to be, really, if you come to think about it, for lack of a better word, or lack of a better word? Well, no one would oppose Agenda 2030 when looking at it from the surface, unless they were willing to dig a little deeper into this sinister plan. It is satanic in origin. I would also like to note that the Great Reset and Build Back Better are all part and parcel in helping to fulfill this the United Nations 17 Sustainable Goals. The United, the United Nations Agenda 2030, 17 Sustainable Goals. Furthermore, on a side note, it was Prime Minister Stephen Harper who signed Canada on to this agreement, thus paving the way for Trudeau to capitalize on it. We don't know of it. Many of us don't know that. Stephen Harper sound, on the surface sounds good. He said, like, you know, with his support for Israel and all of this, he sounds good. But really, uh, it's the exact opposite. And I remember reading in the National Post a while back, and it was actually, this is mainstream media, so it's National Post. And there was an email from Colin Powell, who has since passed on, asking him whether he's going to attend the Bohemian Grove. Have you heard of that? The Bohemian Grove? This is in California. And this is where the elites and the globalists uh, get together. Global elites are invited. And this is not, this is not, this is open now. This is not. And they would, they would have what, what is known, what, they would perform what are known as mock sacrifices to Molech. Mock sacrifices, at least that's what they say. I think Alex, no, I don't recommend Alex Jones, but many, many years ago, about 20 odd years, I think back in 2001, he did a documentary on the Bohemian Grove exposing that. And this was an email written in the National Post where Colin Power asked if he will be attending this year, attending the Bohemian Grove this year. See, we thought of him as a Christian. No doubt he's not. See? These people are into witchcraft. And don't think that those who are into witchcraft can't infiltrate the churches. They do. They do. They can and they do. And in fact, it's one of their desires to do so. It's one of their desires to do so. <clears throat> so Stephen Harper signed, signed on to this agreement, paving the way for Trudeau to capitalize on it. So I think many of us have been duped by Harper and the Conservatives. In committing Canada to the United Nations 2030, Harper essentially signed away the sovereignty of this nation. As awful as Justin Trudeau is, he can't be blamed for this. He's just continuing on what he's already signed on. It's almost like a succession. He's just taken the baton from Harper and continued to run with it. In fact, last year, actually I'll get to that, because I can get to that illustration a little bit later. So now we need to ask another question. What is sustainability? Well, the concept of sustainability or environmentalism is a subject slash initiative that all peoples from all cultures or of all faiths and all political ideologies should be able to support. In plainer words, the rallying of all the people of the earth together to accomplish sustainability would lead, will lead rather to a specific outcome. And this outcome is global unity, global unity. Remember what God said in Genesis 11? The people is one. The people is one. Again, history is repeating itself. Again, we must bear in mind that what we are witnessing before our very eyes is the formation of a global government, global economy, and a global religion. All this will set the stage for the revelation of the Antichrist, who, who this rather Jesus Christ rejecting world will readily receive. The Antichrist will not have to build the new world order himself, no. It will be ready in place for when he is ready to be revealed. This is because it will take much longer than the seven years he has given to build such a system. We are seeing the system essentially almost either being built or almost built right now. It's really kind of amazing and exciting that we're living in that generation, really, when you think about it. I'm not, fra I'm not frazzled by it at all. 
because we know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. The United Nations Agenda 20, with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, is key to building the infrastructure of the end times Antichrist beast system. Moreover, I would like to further add that the 17 SDGs are also being championed by Pope Francis as well, who is doing his best to audition for the role or position of false prophet. Whether he is or not remains to be seen, but he's certainly doing a lot, certainly doing a lot. Pope Francis basically associates man-made climate change with a moral wrong slash sin. That's what he does. This is obviously a fallacious assertion by all accounts. Pope Francis believes that it is a moral imperative that we stop climate change at any cost. He, believe, he believes that we must take from the rich through taxes and give to the poor, i.e. social justice. All of this, including climate change, is all a manufactured hoax, friends. What it all is, is an excuse to implement worldwide socialism slash communism. They will take from the rich companies and give to the poor peoples. Yes, they will take water, land and property away from individual ownership and put it in the hand of government, of the government to redistribute as they see fit. This is the plan. And ultimately it will be in the hands of the Antichrist. I believe that. Under Agenda 2030, we will all become equally poor except for the ruling elite who will remain insanely rich. In fact, they've gotten richer. Over the last two years, they have, absolutely. We've seen the, the greatest transfer of wealth since the you-know-what pandemic began over these last two years. This is the end result of the, of the UN's and Pope Francis's so-called equality, yes. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I believe this will set the stage for the sealed judgments of Revelation 6. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to go to verses 5 and 6. In fact, it will set the stage for all of uh, that. Certainly the first, uh, the four horsemen there. But I'm going to read verses 5 and 6, because I believe what is happening right now is going to lead to this. With the inflation, the, 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 the coming food shortages, or at least the threat of it, and so on and so forth. It all points to this. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So a measure of wheat for a penny. Notice how they mention, they, they mention wheat here. And we're hearing now of shortages of wheat. You know, I don't think that's a, I don't believe that's a coincidence. You know, God knew what was going to happen, of course. But a measure of wheat here speaks that it will take a day's wages to feed one person. And for those of us, for those of you with families, or those of us with families, it will take three measures of barley for a penny. So it'll take a little bit, you can get a little bit more to feed your family. And barley here, uh, back in those days, back in the time of John really was considered almost like what you, uh, food that you would give to, uh, to, to feed uh, this feed, right? For animals, for horses and whatnot. So basically it's like me eating pet food, right? To save money, we're gonna give, we're gonna eat a little bit of dog food, right? Just, you know, that could happen. Don't laugh at it, it can happen. When people are desperate, they will resort to that. Look in the Old Testament under the famine, they ate children, they ate their own babies. So what are the sustainable, 17 sustainable goals? Once again, to reiterate, these goals all seem noble and innocent, but are they? Are they? Well, once I understand their real goals, you will clearly see that they are becoming both clear and bold in their quest for a world government. Just recently, we had the World Government Summit. They're bold. They're bold. Klaus Schwab is saying, get this done now. Get it done now. And you know what? I believe God's going to allow him to. God's going to allow him to. When it's going to get done, when it'll be fulfilled, I do not know. But it's not really for us to concern ourselves with. These goals are not presented as a choice, but rather as a directive. The United Nations says all countries and all stakeholders, that's that word, you should look it up, stakeholders, acting in collaborative partnership will implement this plan. Right? There's one. In other words, all countries must participate. You don't have a choice. Canada, you don't have a choice. Or wherever you're from in the world, Philippines, you don't have a choice. You must participate. They go on to say, as we embark on this collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. No one will be left. Oh, but you know what? 
they will, they will be left behind. They will be left behind. That means no one is allowed to opt out. They will implement taxes to take the individuals. Sorry. Uh, they will implement taxes to take the individuals, the corporations, and the wealthy countries' money, for example. Sorry, rather, for example, they will literally make people pay for the very air they breathe and give it to the poor <laughs> under the ESG system. That's the Environmental Social Governance System as a type of social credit. So then, what are the 17 Sustainable Goals of Agenda 30, 2030? And some of these I go into detail, but not all of them, because for sake of time. Goal one is, is this, end all poverty in all its forms everywhere. That's goal one. End all poverty in all its forms everywhere. Now, this sounds noble, but what they really mean is welfare dependence for all, basically. Welfare dependence for all, i.e. universal basic income. Right now, our parliament is discussing this, a universal basic income for all. And if you tie it in with the fourth industrial revolution, that is because they want to eliminate not just jobs, but professions such as teaching, such as doctors, and replace it with artificial intelligence. Replace it with, with robots, essentially. This is these nutcases. This is their idea. They want centralized control of finance and currencies. Right now, we're on the cusp of moving to a digital currency here in Canada, controlled by the Bank of Canada. And eventually, all central banks will be replaced by the World Bank and when the coming B system arrives, or fully arrives. And you can see how the mark of the B system will eventually be implemented. Now, concerning the goal to end all poverty everywhere, I would like, us to, refer, I would like to refer to us to the very words of our Savior in this matter, because Jesus spoke of the poor here. And he said this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 11. Let's turn there. I'd like to refer you to the very words of our Savior on this matter. Because really, they, they're, they're working in vain to eliminate poverty here. That's really what they want to do. Because Jesus says otherwise. Certainly in the time before his coming, you're not going to eliminate the poor. And Matthew chapter 26 and verse 11 says this. For ye have the poor always with you. Always with you. If these people, Klaus Schwab and all these people knew their Bibles and knew what Jesus said, this agenda wouldn't come to pass. But of course, Satan, you know, they're under the influence of Satan. And I believe also God has put it into their hearts to do that because he rejected him. Just like he's put it into Pharaoh's heart, hardened his heart to reject him and really kick against those pricks, really. Uh, kicking it by uh, by continuing to harden his heart and uh, you know not let Israel go despite all the judgments coming upon him. Really, if you look at the judgments of Egypt, there it's very much typified in the old in, uh, in during the time of the Great Tribulation during the Revelation. There you can see almost a like for like the hardening of the hearts of the people, the hardening of the hearts of the leadership. They're just like Pharaoh, and even the Antichrist will be like Pharaoh. You really, Pharaoh is a type of the final Antichrist that will arrive on the scene. So it says here, for ye, Jesus said, for ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. And he repeats this in John 12 and verse 8, where he says, for the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. So ending all poverty really translates to the redistribution of wealth. Agenda 2030 calls for equal rights to economic resources. That's communism. This means that government seeks to claim an absolute power to take away anything that belongs to you to give to whomever it deems more deserving. You believe the Bible? Okay, we're going to take that away. You can't do this, and we're going to give it to them that are complying. That's the mentality. And I'll read it. When I close, I'll read an article that really, that, that gives, uh, that really explains this well. See, so we see where this is heading. Now we look at goal number two. And goal number two is end hunger, achieve food security, and improved nutrition, and, pro and promote sustainable agriculture. So in other words, this means total control of the world's food supply. Did you not realize that there are three companies in the world that control the whole world's super, uh, food supply? No, they have umbrella companies that they work through. And this is kind of like a pyramid, but ultimately it leads to three companies. I believe Cargill is one, Monsanto, which has been bought, I forgot who they're bought out by. But Cargill was one, Cargill Meats. There's, a, there's three companies, now, I can't remember them off the top of my head, 
that control the global food supply. And when you control the global food supply, you control the people. So now doesn't the fear, the shortages that we keep hearing about these days make sense? Absolutely. We can literally see the path for the revelation of the Black Horse Rider being paved before us. Before our very eyes, rather. This plan details enforcing sustainable farming tactics, which have been proven to drive up the cost of food production while decreasing yield. In other words, these are factory farms, and there are certain protocols that you've got, you know, environmental protocols that you have to abide by. This also includes the use of, uh, uh, of drones and AI that eliminates manual labor, all of these things. So this is really, or basically, the old Soviet practice of farm control that turned the breadbasket of the world into a non-productive wasteland. If you go on the WEF website, there is a section detailing their plan for us to live off eating bugs. Eating bugs, you know, Carl Schwab says, you will eat the bugs, the bugs and you will be happy. <laughs> Goal number three is ensure healthy and promote, uh, right, ensure healthy and promote well-being for all ages. Ensure healthy and promote well-being for all ages. Translation, total control over the world's health care. Now, doesn't the premise of the C pandemic make any sense now or make sense right now? Absolutely. Especially the inordinate emphasis placed on you-know-what as a means of attaining good health. I would like to further add that the global you-know-what program is a significant factor in fulfilling 14 of the United Nations 2030 sustainable goals goals you go on the Gavi website which is the global uh, the Alliance uh, it's an NGO that's funded by you know who uh, it basically has 17 sustainable goals and how these these factor in and accomplishing them and so out of the 17 I don't ask me how it's going to be accomplished but they explain so ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages also means cradle to the grave control over how and where we live and what we are permitted to eat. The healthy lives they promote basically means forcing us out of cars and walking as if we are and walking and into walking rather as we are relocated into controlled high-rise apartment buildings sanctioned by the government. Now you I don't know if you know this, but there is one or no one. And Toronto is one of them. There's a certain area in Toronto, I believe uh, it's near, uh, where is it, the entertainment district there where they do, it's in that area. I could be wrong. Someone correct me if I am. But it, Toronto is one of the smart cities. And basically, is it's basically Big Brother surveillance. They have everything. They have uh, from cameras to artificial intelligence, controlling, and, you know, it's basically... Your, tip, your, your ultimate Orwellian society. That's why they want us in cities, because they can control you. The minute that you live in the country, you become more self-dependent. And, and if you really look at history, for the most part, our economy, right from, from the creation, has been an agricultural economy. It's been based on farming. And what does farming do when you farm? You have your own seeds. By the way, they control the world's seeds. And all the original seeds... The ones that have not been genetically modified are in the seed bank in, what's that country up there? It's part of Denmark. Svalbard. Svalbard. It's kept up there. They're all kept up there. From every nation, they have seeds. There's a storage there. But when we can farm, when we're self-sufficient to a degree, then you can't be controlled. This is why they want us in cities. That's why they want us shopping in supermarkets. That's why they don't want us growing anything. So you could be, you know what? You can be controlled now. You are dependent. You're not, and it's not being dependent. Now we are dependent on God, of course, but in essence, it's really not dependent on, they, from their eyes, dependent, uh, depending on, your, on yourself in a sense to kind of to, to be self-sufficient, but rather on them, on government, on big corporations, because they're all working hand in hand. The healthy lives they promote basically means forcing us out of cars and into walking as we are located in a controlled high-rise uh, apartment building sanctioned by the government. Now, goal number four ensures the inclusive and equitable quality include ensures rather inclusive and equitable quality education and promotes lifelong learning opportunities for all. Mm -hmm. That is goal number four. In plain words, mass indoctrination mm -hmm. through United Nations propaganda. 
brainwashing through compulsory education from the grade, cradle to, to the grave, rather. It has long been known that lifelong learning is the means to continually apply behavior modification practices to ensure we maintain the desired attitudes, values, and beliefs to live in the global community. And I believe that this whole you know what that we've experienced the past two years and the mandates, it's really served to condition people, change their behavior. But if you have the Word of God right here, this book here ought to change your behavior. But if not, Satan will give you that, uh, that alternative to the Word of God. And this is what they're done. And I'm not putting down people I work with or people who choose to wear masks or whatever. I'm not putting it down. There's a reason for it. But the thing is, we've been conditioned to believe that this actually protects from the spread of disease. But you know what? We've had spread of disease before this whole two-year thing happened. We had the spread. We had flus going around. We had coronaviruses going around that could make you very sick and kill the elderly. This all happened before. But again, we've been conditioned, right? And eventually, we're going to be the world's going to be conditioned to be so controlled that they will rely on the Antichrist, really, to direct their paths. As the Lord said in Genesis 11, the people is one. The people is one. Revelation 17, speaking of uh, the ten kings, these have one mind. These have one mind. And this again speaks of the ten kings that will rule over the coming ten nations slash region confederate. I don't know if you know about the Club, Club of Rome back in 1968, I think it was, the Club of Rome a document where they actually set out ten, uh, ten regions of the world. They were going to they divided the world into ten regions. Kind of makes you think, you, know, you think about the ten kings. The goal of ensuring quality education for all is part of why there is a sudden push for teaching our children the critical race theory and the perverted sex ed curriculums. Some of the things that they are indoctrinating our young five-year-olds, six-year-olds, or whatever, whatever age, rather, regarding sex ed is, is nothing more than perversion. It's absolutely disgusting. I cannot even repeat it from the pulpit. That's how disgusting it is. Shame on those teachers. It's shame on them. And gee, if, if they've not read the Bible, that it's better for a millstone to be hung around their neck and to commit suicide and drown in the sea? Absolutely. But what does the Bible say we ought to teach our children? What does the Bible say? And I would like us to first turn to Exodus 12, verse, Exodus, sorry, 24 and verse 12. Exodus 24 and verse 12. Let's look at look what the Bible says, what we ought to teach our children. Exodus uh, chapter 24, verse 12, and the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me, come up, sorry, come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tablets of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest what? Teach them. Over to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. And these, word, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt what? Teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou, wast, liest, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Teach them. Teach them. Now, goal number five. Goal number five. And goal number five is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Again, I want to repeat this. Goal number five is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. In other words, you want to destroy the nuclear family. They want to destroy the nuclear family. And this is Marxism. 
This is also a mechanism that is employed to achieve population control through forced family planning. Furthermore, what hypocrisy of an organization trying to achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women whilst flying the rainbow flag on one side of the world and ignoring Sharia law and its war on women on the other side of the world. This is the United Nations. They promote one and at the same time they're ignoring Sharia law and Saudi Arabia and other places, Iran. Skull brings to mind what the prophet Isaiah said concerning the empowerment of women in Israel, uh, in Israel in his day. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12. Goal number 5, rather, brings to mind what the prophet Isaiah said concerning the empowerment and leadership, rather, of women in Israel of his day. And God is not happy with that. God is not happy. There is a place where women can give glory to God, but it's not in places of leadership. It's not in places where they are usurping, usurping rather, the authority of man. Absolutely not. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12, and it says, As for my people, speaking of Israel, are you there? I'll give you some time. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Again, this is a child-centered society. And what? Women rule over them. Women rule. Rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. In other words, you know what? These women are causing you to err and destroy the way of thy past. That's not a popular message today. It's not. But this is what God says. Let's go to the Genesis. Let's go back now to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. In verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall what? Rule over thee. We're not talking about a dictatorship here, right? We're not talking, but we're talking about headship. Headship, right? The buck has to fall somewhere. You can't have all chiefs, especially in the marriage. Or in any, any really, it can go beyond the marriage. It can be in the workplace. It can be in the workplace. And I'm going to tell you something. I, the company I work for, when women are in, 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 uh, in uh, power and authority, they literally get power hungry. They are drunk on that power, more so than men. I'm not saying that men can't be drunk on that power, but generally the women really are drunk on that power. I'm sure if that my warehouse manager ever who was a woman, ever heard me say this, should not be too pleased. But you know what? It's true. It's true. It's true. You need to self-examine yourself. Are you drunk on power? Are you drunk on power? Proverbs 12 and verse 4. Proverbs 12 and verse 4. Proverbs 12 and verse 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Again, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. 1 Timothy 2, New Testament now. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. Actually, it's going to be verses 11 and 12. First Timothy two. First Timothy two, verse eleven, and the Bible says this: Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to what teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. But to be in silence, again, this is not a popular verse, not a popular concept today. 
You know, I've heard, I've actually heard in the workplace, I'm not going to have anyone tell me what to do. Yeah. And that tone as well. Yeah. <laughs> that tone. Revelation 2 and verse 20. Revelation 2 and verse 20. Revelation 2 and verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman. In other words, you, you, this church, uh, you allow that woman, that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed in the aisle. I was talking about women preachers there. Women preachers. Goal number six now. Goal number six. Goal number six is to ensure availability, management of water, and sanitation for all. Availability, management of water, and sanitation for all. Translation, water rationing. All water sources will be privatized and will continue to be poisoned with fluoride and other toxic elements. The annihilation says that, the, you know what, well, over the last two years, has demonstrated the critical import importance of sanitation, hygiene, and adequate access to clean water for preventing and containing diseases. So you can see how it's tied into the United Nations Agenda 2030. It's not separate. It was planned. And I'm going through these. I'm not going to. Be, I'm going to go through some of the, the rest of the goals, but more, you know, truncated. Goal number seven is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. What this means is the installation of smart grid surveillance with smart meters on everything and peak pricing. This is something that we have been experiencing for some time now. Everyone has a smart meter. Everyone. If you're paying hydro, it's a smart meter. Though. And I would also urge you to look up, as I mentioned earlier, smart cities. Any, in fact, wherever you see anything smart, like we have a smartphone recording us, anything smart before, I guess it's like a prefix now, before anything. And then one preacher said this. He said, when you see smart, just think of Big Brother. Just replace smart with Big Brother. Big Brother surveillance. And that's what it is. You have Google Hub. You've got smart homes. Smart surveillance systems, uh, uh, smart home security, you name it. You got smart everything, smart traffic lights, and so on and so forth. The United Nations solution to goal number seven for the globalists is to ban oil and enforce upon us green renewable energy such as wind and solar power, which is not cost efficient. That's why the cost of energy is just skyrocketing, right? What this has done is effectively driven up energy costs across the globe. Goal number eight is to promote, promote rather, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Right? And meanwhile, the opposite of doing the opposite. In other words, this means we'll have no property rights and trans and Trans-Pacific Partnership free trade zones. Right? So we'll have no property rights. That's what that means. In fact, as I mentioned, uh, last year, around this time, we passed our parliament, federal parliament. It's already in law now. The United Nations, uh, it's called UNDRIP, right? Bill C-15. And it's under the guise of, uh, of uh, making repar reparations to the indigenous peoples. But that's not what it is. It really gives the government power to take your land and to remove your land under reparations to the indigenous peoples. So again, this all ties in. Goal number nine is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Translation, toll roads, the pushing of public transit, removal of free travel, right? Removal, we're seeing this right now today, and environmental restrictions, which I will cover at the end of this. And then we have goal number two, 10 rather, and that is to reduce inequality within and among countries. This translates into even more regional government bureaucracy, in other words, welfare. Goal number 11, and that is to make cities and human settlement, settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Translation, the installation of Orwellian Big Brother Big Data AI surveillance. That's what it is. In fact, AI, they say AI basically uh, is translated as big data. In other words, big data is the food. What it does, it, it uses algorithms, right? Patterns, they're computer generated and it mines that data. So every email that you send, 
every website that you visit, uh, basically, even, even now it's listening to us, so it'll mine that, it stores that through power, super, super uh, through quantum computers into a database, and it takes it all together, and then it, de it develops patterns. Right now, you have grammar checkers run by AI. That didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen overnight. I don't think it's good, to be honest with you, because then it doesn't teach you anything. It just kind of, you rely on it rather than actually learning grammar. Goal number 12, ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Translation, this is nothing more than forced austerity measures, right? They're going to tell you what you can eat, when you can eat, and how you can eat it. And what you can eat. Goal number 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Translation, employment of environmental social government scores, a.k.a. Chinese-style social credit system. Also, cap and trade, which you probably heard, and carbon taxes and credits, which we're paying at the pump, and footprint taxes. That's your carbon footprint. Goal number 14, and that is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, sea sand, seas rather, ocean seas, and, let me repeat, sustainability, sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. And this means environmental restrictions, control of all oceans, including mineral Mineral rights from ocean floors, right? Control just basically the world's resources. And goal number 15 is to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, desertification, well, not desertification, but desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. In other words, this, is, this literally means is that they're going to take people they're going to designate large swaths of land as green areas that humans, men, cannot inhabit. There are no go zones. That's what this means. So in other words, the environmental restrictions and more controlling of resources and mineral rights. So in other words, basically say we want to now uh, conserve the land because man is ruining it. So we want to uh, have you live in these small little, port, uh, small little areas that we've designated that you can live. This is what it translates to. Goal number 16, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. The translation, the translation for this is more UN peacekeeping missions and the removal of gun rights. In the United States, in the United States this means the removal of the Second Amendment rights under their constitution. Right? They, don't want, they want you to have the power to defend yourself. And lastly here, goal number 17 is to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. And this translates to the removal of national sovereignty worldwide, thus setting the stage for a one world government. Remember, the people is one. The people is one. The ten kings, these all had one mind. The Lord put it in them, right? It was God who put it in them to have one mind. So in closing, I would like to read this article from the Hill publication.